You know, I realize that one of the things I, I don't like this classroom at all. <laughs> For those of you who haven't heard me say I hate this classroom, and one of the things I hate is that. And at, at, at the main campus, it's, it's actually a lot better. It's in the back of the classroom. So the instructor knows what's going on and can measure what's going on. And the students don't go, <laughs> yeah. how much longer is she going to talk? So anyway, uh, we'll see. We, yeah, can, that's what, we can take it down if you like. We should. <laughs> OK, so it, it's OK. We'll just stay till 6.10. It's no big deal. Well, we'll make sure you perfect. get your money's worth. Christian is not here. Did he have a baby or something? Does anybody know? Does anybody know Christian? No. The guy that was in the back, that came in late. Don't even know your class. Ah, uh, yeah, I saw. Uh, he was in the back. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen. We're missing five people that I don't know, so we're going to take roll. And whoever's not here is going to get a zero for the day. <laughs> Sounds typical. Does that sound like me? <laughs> yeah. Well, vacation. <laughs> Whose garculator is this? Oh, well, it's Matt. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Did he leave? Somebody scream out in the hallway. How much these things cost? He said he brought it in 1984. It prints a receipt. It prints a receipt? <laughs> <laughs> For tax purposes. Um, WC, WCI? WCI right now? No. Okay. No, no. We have a speaker, but I, I just, you know, I'm trying to get set up and all that. Since you had a student that kept me outside for like half an hour. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, Danny. Who was that? And and I just I couldn't come here on time and you know be prepared and all that. So, but anyway, so if we stay late because we don't go through the material, it's the one student who. Oh, uh -oh. oh, we want names oh. now. Oh. No, no. We want names. We appreciate it. Sound check. Check. There you got it. All right. Listen. Let's go through roll because I want to make sure everybody's here. Christian is not here. Um, he apparently was having or had a baby last night. Who's uh, egg? Dustin? Yep. I saw you. Um, Alexander, you're here. Daryl, you're here. I saw you. Where, where'd you go? He, he is here, right? He's right yeah, behind yeah, you, yeah, right, yeah, Frederick? Yeah. Uh, Brian, you're there. Um, Antoine? Come on, that partner. Everything good? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> That's in the front anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Maria. Elena. Elena, are you Elena? Are you Marta? Yes, my first name is Elena. My middle name is Marta, but you Marta. But the. But which I one do you want me to use? Because Marta, you have like names Marta. here. I'm not sure which one to use. Yeah, yeah, you are right. You are no, right. no, Marta, Elena, no, Tim, I, I just no, don't no, know no, which no, one no. to call you by. No, you know it. In Latin America, you use No, no, you have like... Yeah, that. But you're not Brazilian, right? Argentina. No, por eso. No, no, I get it. No, no, the Brazilians... No, the Brazilians yeah. have like... No, I don't. So they only use one name. So which name are you going to use? I want to use Marta. Marta. Yeah. Like the soccer player, Marta. Yeah. Marta. Without H. Marta with. Not Marta. 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 Get it right. Not Marta. Without H. Okay, Frederick, you're here. Kyle, Thank I you. saw you. Yes, you're welcome. Anthony, oh, you came up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One. One went to the back. Chad, where'd you go? There you are. Maricela, you're hiding over there. Uh, Ryan, I saw you yeah. somewhere. There you go, you there moved you go. up. He's got his seat. Melissa, you're here. Irene and Justin. I saw Justin. Okay. Listen, just 
just a couple of things uh, that I, I want to uh, go over before we start the class and, and while I have you focused, okay? Um, today we are going to go through a lot of material, a lot of material. So I, I hope you guys got your coffee. I, I hope you guys are focused because we're going to move through a lot, Red Bull, whatever, okay? Uh, on the technical accounting material, we're going to go through lease accounting today or accounting for leases and how that impacts the real estate industry. We are going to go over some basic concepts in financial analysis, which will help us with the case study for the next class. Uh, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on budgeting. I spend more time on that. We'll do a little bit more of that as the class goes on. But you've got an investments class that hopefully is just tackling that in great detail. And we'll do something that I added somewhere along the way, a module on credit analysis which I think is important for people involved in the real estate industry, especially on the property management side, okay? So um, I, I just want to make a reminder, guys, I, when I said no phones and all that the other day, I really meant it in computers and all that stuff I, I, and, and talking. We, I mentioned that the other day. It was a lot of talking. There was a lot of grumbling at the end. We had a test, and some people didn't know certain things, and I know there was a lot of talking going on during the day, so when we're talking, we're not living in the middle of it. I own up. Okay. <laughs> he owns up. Okay, good. Big man. So if we talk a lot, I'm glad you, you yeah. It happens as an adult. I, I can tell you I sat at a board meeting of a public company and I had the CEO and the chairman come to me and say, can you please sit between these two directors today? Because I can't take their talking during the meeting. And these are grown men, one of who is a very, very supposedly respectable person in town. I won't say who he is. Uh, in this industry. Uh, what well, we went over last week. Okay, and we have a, a guest speaker, which I'm going to introduce in a second. I'm going to turn over the floor to him for some time. Uh, last week we went over some basic, we did a little basic accounting primer. Okay, we spent about an hour just kind of going how debits and credits roll up and everything. Uh, we reviewed key terms, accounting and financial terms in the industry, and I encourage you to continue to refer to that, that handout that I gave you because in this class and in this program and in your careers, you're going to continue to uh, continually hear those terms, okay? Uh, we went over some current events and we, we just went over the table of contents of the 10K, which hopefully you're now intimately familiar with. Now, there was a question that was left over for me regarding 1031s, and I... We'll, we'll go over 1031s again um, briefly, but the question originally was, or the question that I wanted to clarify was, do we identify property with the value of the gain or the, va the, the value of the property? And specifically, the guidance is, is um, that you can identify property, okay, okay, not to exceed 200% of the value of the relinquished property, okay? Mm -hmm. Just a couple of things that I wanted to add to that, and then we can go over it in greater detail. Um, uh, just a couple of things. So, you know, you can go pull up U.S. Um, uh, the U.S. Code, Section 26, or 26, Section 1031, which deals with, like, uh, um, exchange of properties, right? And the non-recognition of gain or loss. but. It basically applies to anything that is not stock, bonds, securities, interest, and partnerships. So it specifically, you I mean, ultimately come back to property used in a trade or business, which could be real estate. Okay, and we'll talk about 1250 and 1245 and 1231 property later on. Uh, we talked the other day about a, a essentially what's called a deferred 1031, but I, I did fail to mention the other day there are other types of there is a simultaneous exchange. The swap is done at the same time. There is a reverse exchange, okay, in which you actually sell your, I'm sorry, buy the property and then sell, okay? You can go work it backwards. Uh, and then there's a build to sue, but that's a very difficult one to accomplish. So uh, the only other thing I wanted to say is, is that as much as the identification of the rules are, are very broad as to what is like kind, so real estate can, take land for an apartment building. It's very broad. What you cannot do is, and what's not deemed to be like kind is, is U.S. sales of real estate are not like foreign real estate. So you cannot do a 1031 
and reinvest in foreign assets. Okay, so mm -hmm. you know it's U.S. to U.S. Okay. Okay. And uh, um, we'll talk. I'll, I'll keep these notes that I, I pulled together. I pulled a fair bit out from the Internal Revenue site from a couple of law firms. We'll go over that in the last session when we go over accounting. But I'm sorry over taxation. But what I encourage you to do is to do the same thing that I just did. Is if there's something that piques your interest in this class or in any other class, or while you're reading, take the time to research it. That's how we learn. And ultimately, and as I said, that's why we're here. We're here to learn, and um, uh, it, it takes effort. It takes time, OK? OK, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to, um, I, I have yes, sir. So, so you said it was up to 200%? So yeah, you, so the. So that takes off the table to park with a permit? Like you couldn't? We had talked about that. Like, can you take a partial? You can do partial, right? And I, I didn't, I didn't read that. You can, you can defer the entire amount or a partial if you reinvest less and you do it on a pro rata basis. Okay, so you can identify property less than. The you can identify less. You, you don't. Okay. You, you can up, up to two hundred percent, okay. and that's with a limitless number of properties. Right. right. Okay. So, however, you know, logically fit in. The, the, the other option is three properties irrespective of value, three specific properties. What gives you more flexibility? The percentage one, I think, ultimately, because you typically can get more properties into it. But if you know that there's only three properties you've already got your eye on, then you can just go to that. OK? okay? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Any other questions from last week? OK. Um, one more. So yes, Frederick. Would, uh, PPE. I keep wanting to say uh, party plan. Plant property and equipment or property plant and equipment. Okay, With not to do with FF and E, right? Furniture, fixtures, and equipment, okay? Property was this like a question on the test? Um, yeah. Yeah. Plant property and equipment. Plant. Plant. Or property plant and equipment, depending on Chad. So you talked about the swap, 1031 swap. So ideally, you would do a swap with an unlimited value piece of real estate. Right, you well, you ideally want to at least swap it into an asset that has equivalent value so that you can fully defer it again. Correct. But you can do that. That's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm invested in a fund right now, and I, you know, they sold something. We bought something with the intention to hold it. A guy came in off the street, made a ridiculous offer on it, and he sold it. Huge gain. Now, you know, we don't want the money back, and we don't want to pay tax, right? But then the issue is, is the guy knocked on the door and solicited, how do you identify replacement property in 45 days and how do you close in 180 and make sure that it's a good deal? And so they've got something. They've now they've gone hard on it. They haven't closed on it. You know, my question as an investor is, are they just forcing this to, you know, defer the gain? And is that really, you know, you eventually have to pay the piper, you know, and, and everybody's got a different perspective. Were you at Cadena when we did the 1033? Sure. Um, we had the, the, the Beacon, the, the MDX took the land at Beacon Lakes. Sure. So we had a, we owned a piece of land, a pretty significant chunk of land, around about 400 acres with what is now Pro Lodges. On, if this is the Florida Turnpike, um, and this is 836. 836 used to end at the turnpike and it used to go north or south. And so we had a, a big development, which is still called Beacon Lakes. Pro Lodges owns it out right now, but we were partners with them. So when they extended 836, um, the MDX took like 22 acres from us here, or I think $22 million or we got, maybe it was 17 acres or something, whatever. So they could run the extension of, 130, of 836 to 132nd Avenue. And so, you know, we, paid like a buck a square foot for the land. We ultimately got over a million bucks an acre for it. And so we, we wanted to elect a 1033 exchange, right? So we wanted to say, hey, let's push off paying the tax for another three years. And our partner was like, let's pay the tax. We're going to have to pay it eventually. Pay the tax. They eventually agreed to do it, but we eventually had to wind up paying the tax, right? And what happens is, you know, three years later, you get pissed and you go, why didn't we pay the tax then? Now I got to pay it. But, uh, so, I mean, there's just different schools of thought. Like I tell you, there's there's the guy who wants to just pay the tax and sleep well and be done with it. But 
you know, the, the financial mind would say, postpone payment of taxes as long as you can. Mm -hmm. well, you have like two seven. years for the 1033. I'm sorry, two years. Did I say three? Yeah. 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 Okay. Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, was wrong. Two years. Yes. Good on. Good on. Okay. <laughs> Dustin. So on the reverse, that would be a good strategy That's because you could identify the property and then sell your property. Well, it actually you works. You sell, and then you've got 45 days to identify. And, and uh, no, 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 no. Reverse is the other way. You buy, you buy, and then you've got you buy first, right? You buy first. You do it the other way. You buy, and then you've got the 180 days to sell a property. Okay. Okay. So let's leave that. So let's go back to. Uh, for me, it's always it's always nice to bring um, one former student, which I do sporadically in the class, and two colleagues. Uh, I met Ali what 10, 12 years ago, something like that. Ten years ago, um, Ali Dominguez came to work with us at Kadena in the accounting area. He worked with us for a while, and then um, he went to Greener Pastures. And then uh, about three, four years ago, four years ago, five, five right. years ago. Five. Time blows. Five years ago, uh, Ali came to work with uh, Mr. Kodina's family office, which is not only a family office, but it has a fair bit of development activities associated with it. And I'll I'll let him give a little bit of a, of a, a background on that. But it's a joy to have him come. Uh, he essentially is the day-to-day -day finance guy there. He's done everything there. He continues to do everything there. And um, I want to welcome. He's going to talk to us about a specific topic that I think is relevant to an accounting class, but I'll let him give, give you a little bit of background about who he is, how he got here, and uh, feel free to ask him any questions about what he does, how he does it, how he got to where he is, uh, about what their business model is, anything. So we're going to go through lunch likely with him. Uh, so I'll turn the floor over to Ali Dominguez. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, Thank you, uh, Jorge, for having me. Um, like you said, my, my name is Ali Dominguez. My, my title at Godina Partners, which is the name of the firm uh, where I'm working right now, is uh, Director of Accounting. Um, initially, uh, when the uh, company got put together five years ago, it was supposed to be a small boutique firm um, after uh, Armando Godina, who is a real estate developer and has developed here in South Florida for over 30 years, uh, thought of retiring. And, Thought it was going to be, you know, a small shop, family office. Um, of course, that that's not the case today. Uh, things have really ramped up over the five years, uh, and I've had the great opportunity of being there since day zero to set everything up. Uh, I have seen it grown to, you know, where we are today. Uh, so I'm hoping to give you guys share some of the experiences that I've had over the last five years working here. Uh, tell you how a little bit how we're structured, right? Uh, how the accounting for all the different things we do uh, uh, affect our financials and how diverse they are. And uh, hopefully you guys will, will have some questions and I can shed some insight into, into what this is all about. So, uh, Again, the name of the company is uh, Codina Partners. Uh, Mr. Codina owned Codina Group. Uh, he had that company, I believe, since 19, the, the 80s, is that right? That's the early 80s. Um, and uh, that company, subsequently, in the year 2006, was uh, merged with Flagler uh, Real Estate. Uh, and uh, subsequent to that, the company sold to a private equity firm. Um, and he thought he, he would retire. I started working for Codina Group about 10 years ago. Started working under the construction accounting area. I was basically mainly doing construction drawings. I had an in-house general contractor. Um, and from there, you know, uh, moved on to work on the development side and started doing the accounting for some of their uh, developments here in South Florida, some of the buildings in Flagler Station, some of their office space in Orlando, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, I specifically also worked on a project called Downtown Doral. I don't know if you guys have, have heard of Downtown Doral. Uh, Downtown Doral's been a long time in the making. And uh, back then it was, you know, it was a very big uh, concept, but uh, very far from reality. And over the last three, four years, we have really seen a lot of growth and a lot of uh, 
a lot of momentum pick up in regards to that project. And out of all the projects we currently have, that's probably the one that is keeping us most busy right now. And, and Ali just mentioned that that was a project that Mr. Kadina kept after all these sales. That's right. It was not something that within was within the purview, let's say, of what Fortress, who bought Florida East Coast Industries, wanted to continue. So Mr. Kadina basically took that with him as he formed his family office. And so it's a project that's a joint venture, right? It's part, a, yeah. With part. JP Morgan and right, right. And, uh, and it's out, totally outside the purview of Florida East Coast Industries now, or Flagler Development. It is. It is. Um, I'll tell you guys a little bit, a little bit more in detail uh, regarding that project. But what we do today basically, you know, breaks down into what I call three divisions. We have a single family uh, home builder uh, with home. Uh, you know, we're partners with uh, Jim Carr. Jim Carr has been a, a residential developer here in South Florida for over 30 years. Uh, that business now is called CC Homes. Um, we also have a uh, multifamily uh, business called CC Residential. And then we have Kadena Partners. And Kadena Partners does a little bit of everything. I'll tell you a little bit about each one. Um, on CC Homes, uh, CC Homes is a home builder, uh, has projects of single family homes um, uh, all the way from Naples, actually from Jacksonville, all the way to, to Miami. Um, currently, one of, some of the projects we have most recently uh, completed include Montero, which is a large oh, single yeah. family uh, project. We're currently developing another project similar to that, close to 75 in, uh, in Hialeah, called Montero. Um, we have projects in Naples where we're developing part of the residential area in Ave Maria, uh, and additional projects here in, in, in Broward. Uh, this entity is also developing uh, 85, of which they're mostly sold, uh, townhomes in downtown Doral. Um, we have a multifamily group uh, called CC Residential, and that group, uh, over the last three, four years, has developed almost a thousand apartments. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, uh, you guys may know, is uh, Signature at Doral, which is the one on the intersection of basically the Turnpike and 41st Street. Uh, also Signature at Davy. We developed a second phase for Davy called uh, Signature at Davy 2, which was 150 townhomes. Uh, we're currently developing 396 units uh, on Kendall Drive and about 172nd on West in, in Kendall. Uh, and we are breaking ground under the multifamily business on a 16-story uh, high-rise apartment complex in Coral Gables. Uh, so there's a lot going on in the multifamily business. I'm sure you guys are, are very familiar with, with, you know, with the trends in apartments and, and rents. It's a very hot, hot market right now. And uh, we have seen a lot, a lot of growth in, uh, in this area of the business. Uh, then we have Kadena Partners, and Kadena Partners... Let me, let me, let me ask a question, just uh, so the, the class can get a sense of scale. The home building business, one of the good metrics that people take a look at is the inventory or the capacity to develop that a home builder could have. Sure. And so the question is, is how many home sites or buildable lots does the company either control or have under contract or option or sure. the ability to get to? Sure. Sure. Uh, I think CC Homes right now uh, is probably sitting on about, I think, between 800 and 1,000 lots of single-family residences, um, some of which we have partnerships with different home builders, some of which we're doing, we're doing on our own. And the reason I ask that question, Clap, that ultimately you stop to think that home builders are very much development businesses, but they are, you know, different. And as a home builder, you know, and being a manufacturer, having the right or the inventory is critical to having a pipeline or a steady stream of cash or business down the line. And obviously that depends on general economic conditions. But if you don't have the lots or you don't have the control of the lots, and we'll talk about that with WCI and some of the off-balance sheet financing and that kind of question that I asked, 
But a home builder's capacity to generate income in the future ultimately is tied to their inventory and, and their ability or their access to land. Um, it's very good. So it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, otherwise, a home builder it's, it has the ability to develop, but not the access or the means to get to the land, which down here in South Florida is very, very scarce. Um, Moving down, Codino Partners is, is, a, is an entity that does a lot of things. Um, it serves as a development manager for a lot of projects. Um, we have done fee, fee development for uh, multifamily and for office space. Um, it serves also as the uh, house for many of the investments, real estate investments, uh, that, you know, that, are, that are part of, of the Codino family. Uh, it serves also um, as the uh, entity that manages a real estate fund, a $50 million real estate fund that owns assets here in Florida as well as out of state. Um, it houses also the operating entity, which now consists of over 30 employees. Um, and uh, it also houses uh, certain other investments that are not real estate related. So there's a little bit of everything uh, going on, uh, anywhere from investment accounting all the way to real estate development. Um, inside of Cadena Partners, we have the development for downtown the route, yes? I have a question. Do you have <coughs> any conflict of interest for your fund to co-invest in your developments? Our fund doesn't co-invest in our developments. Does it? No, no. There, there may be the case where one of the fund, uh, the fund may have a project, and that project may need a development manager service. Uh, when we may enter into an agreement to develop that, right, uh, okay. for a market fee. Uh, but other than that, no. But but if I if I could pipe, and I and I've said it before, I am one of I'm the smallest I think investor in that fund. Well, that's a that's an excellent question, and 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 the problem that exists in real estate, especially when you have friends and family and other relationships and businesses is, is the potential for conflict situations to exist. And they will arise in real estate. So it just, you know, the only thing I, I ask, and I, I had a student the other day call me with, you know, a potential investment, uh, always ask the question, you know, buyer beware, right? Always, and the fact that there is a, what we call an accounting, a less than arm's length trans transaction, Right, or a related party transaction doesn't necessarily mean it's not done at arm's length, right? So uh, uh, a fund managed by Kadena Partners may engage one of the services of a related entity, and if it pays fair market value for the services, the fact that it's dealing with a related party doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's not at a fair market value. But that's something that we always need to ask. So the question I was going to ask, a typical development fee in the industry is? Typical development fee ranges anywhere between 3 and 5%. Okay. And the larger the scale of the project, the lower the, the lower percentage. Is. And as I mentioned, and I will keep mentioning because this is stuff that needs to, you know, sort of sink in, right? Uh, uh, typically for that development fee, there's no reimbursements, but you may be able to negotiate a, 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 an employee re reimbursement, a project manager or financial services or something, okay? Uh, I was going with this, where was I going with the development firm? Sorry. Oh, just a quick question, Go just ahead. for comparison, what type of inventory does the multifamily side have? The multifamily business um, doesn't have inventory as the home builder does. Okay. And the reason for that is the multifamily business basically looks for a piece of property. And once it finds that piece of property, it more than likely already has a partner or, or an institution or someone lined up with whom they're going to transact, right? Uh, being that these are not condos, if we develop uh, 350 units, those, all those units will be sold to one buyer. Hmm. Hmm. Right, so you're not. You know, it's not condo, so you're selling the property as a whole. So, this you know, this entity may have maybe one land parcel or two in its inventory, but.
but no more than that because they're very capital in, you know, intensive. Uh, and, and guys, the, the multifamily is very much a merchant development model. Sure. And if you, if you, that's just business tradition. Again, the capital has a lot to do with it because the flip side of, and again, we'll go back to the off-balance sheet financing. The off-side of controlling inventory is that there's something that you're hopefully learning in your other class, which is a time value of money. So while it's great to hog you know, a lot of land, the longer you're holding on to something, the lower your return, right? The quicker that you can churn through an investment, hopefully the higher the return. So if you go out there and all of a sudden you control by outright paying 10 sites to do future developments, what's that gonna do you know, to your holding period? You know, what's that gonna do to your return? IR, so, Yeah, you mean your, your IR takes a hit and also you're running market risk. I mean, you don't wanna be sitting on, on 20 acres to develop multifamily for too long <clears throat> if there's a swing in the market, you could you could really take a hit. Um, the question that was asked was development fees are three to five percent of what? And it, that's again that's a negotiated inst that's a sure. negotiated figure sure. between partners. But, I'll leave <coughs> but usually a a development you you know not usually always you will have a, a something called a development management services agreement, okay? And that agreement will outline the responsibilities of the developing party uh, with the developer. Uh, or with the owner uh, and you know it'll literally state what the responsibilities are of the developer to deliver this property on such and such a date to do it within budget right and it'll actually say you know what is what can you do how you can transact if you have a bust on a line item if you budgeted half a million dollars for impact fees and you wanted up spending more for X reason that the agreement may, may literally say anything above $25,000, you need to go to the owner and get their approval. Right. Or it may say anything above X percentage variance, you may need to get an approval on. Uh, the other thing that it'll say, it'll say uh, compensation, your compensation is X percentage of cost. Now, it may say cost, or it may say your, uh, your fee is X percentage of revised cost, right? And then the way they, rev they do revised costs is they may say, well, the, to build the entire project is gonna cost $60 million, but for purpose of your development fee, you're not gonna consider these following categories of cost, right? Yes. Who would the owner be considered in this example? Would, would Codina partner up with a, a, somebody who provides a property and create an LLC, and then they become the owner, <laughs> and then they hire multifamily uh, to develop the property. Right, so it's a good question. One, uh, one setup that, I, that we have seen very common under the multifamily uh, business is that we have seen real estate funds or institutions who are basically sitting on a lot of cash and want to create something that's going to create a stream of cash flow for, for them. So basically you would have a Codina entity partnering up with that institution to create a joint venture to develop that property, right? More than likely, there will be a closing of land prior or at the time of the inception of the joint venture. And part of the deal would be that, you know, that new joint venture will contract CC Residential to be the development manager, okay? Now, CC Residential's responsibility would include bidding out the job finding the general contractor, right? Obtaining different quotes from different, uh, for different GMPs to make sure that they understand, the owner understands that they got a competitive bid and they were awarded to a contractor who showed that they could deliver the job on, on budget. Um, and that's who, uh, you know, that entity would be that the one that signs the contract with CC Residential. Let me, uh if I could just jump in a second, and I, I kind of drew a little bit of this the other day, but I want to, this is a very unique animal, okay, and it could be, a lot of different entities can function a lot of different, you know, ways. Let me just draw out for you really quickly what a typical merchant development structure might be, okay, and so let's use the name Terry Styles. this business, I don't know, I've never worked with, with Terry, but uh, I, I'm going to tell you, and it's business has a couple of other divisions, okay, but a company like Styles, which is a traditional 
merchant builder. Kadena was a traditional merchant builder. Procacci Butters are traditional merchant builders in South Florida. I say merchant developers, I should say. The typical structure would be you've got a holding company, okay, which may or may not have equity interests in a business. And as I said the other day, what would be more typical is that the managers or the owners of this business would be the ones that own the equity interests outside this entity, okay? But but these are fee, fee, fee animals, okay? This is where the employees work, and what they're trying to do is recover the costs for those employees. So Styles would have a development company, a construction company, a brokerage firm, a property management business. And each one of these entities that employs all these people is going to charge a fee to somebody. Now your question is, who is that somebody? That somebody could be a third party, okay? So, um, Prudential, MetLife, JP Morgan, you know, some guy with a lot of money, a lot of money says, hey, uh, we want to redevelop the Boca Town Center. Teachers owns the Boca Town Center. We need somebody to redevelop it, you know? And Style says, hey, we got a lot of retail expertise. We got a construction business. We got property management. And so, Teachers doesn't want to give up ownership of the town center, but they'll hire Styles to redevelop it. No pay Styles, 5%. To answer your question, the development cost typically excludes land, okay? That's the one thing that owners tend to be sticky about, saying we're not going to pay you a fee for land that we're bringing into a deal. But So teachers will engage Styles. They'll pay them 5% of development costs to develop, be, to orchestrate the business. They'll pay the construction company, again, it'll be bid and all that, but they'll probably pay them a 5% to 6% construction management fee, okay? And then they'll engage the brokerage for whatever the market rates are, and then they'll engage a the property management business. And what are typical property management fees? 5%. 5%. Eight. Eight. That's in Venezuela. How about in America? 2%. Let's let's say two percent of what? Of what? Two percent of what? NOI. Construct property management. This is ongoing business. Well, then why you be out of business? Rent. 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 Rent receipts. Rent. Okay. Cash receipts. Rent. Okay. Gross receipts. Whatever. Okay. So some some variation of of top line. Okay. But. To your question, Brian, it is important to understand this in a development program, okay? These development businesses typically operate, operate to earn fees, okay? And nothing else, okay? I don't, I didn't mean to steal your thunder, Ali, but I want to no, no, no. In, the, in the top one there, that would be a share of profits. The holding this, company. This entity? The holding company. Okay, no, so let me, so, so this is when you engage a third party, okay? Now, what is typical is, okay, so now I'm style. So I'm a developer, right? I got, you know, fast cars, beautiful women, and no money. Okay? That's the way it is. But I, the world thinks I'm filthy rich, okay? So what will typically happen is I'll say, hey, you know, I know, hey, I know the guy at the city of Fort Lauderdale that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win the bid for that piece of land, okay? So, you know, they do like, you know, some sort of public contest. I know the guy. All of a sudden, I get awarded the right to develop this piece of land, but I got no money because I spent it all on you know fast cars and beautiful women, right? So now, what do I have? I have an idea. I have a dream. I have a potential development, right? I have some value, but I don't have money. So what I'll do is, is I'll go and create a joint venture, okay, with somebody like Teachers or Matt or Pru or Northwest, you know, whatever, okay? I'll set up a joint venture. And again, the rare example would be that this holding company actually owns those interests. What would be typical is, is that the principals and potentially some managers or key managers of this business would be the partners in a joint venture between a financial partner and these individuals. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, I think you're and always going to see the services aside from the investments. Yeah, the, usually the service companies are not. Uh, are not on the, they, same, they, on the same ownership side yeah, as the investment. There's typically, you know, that's typically, you know, something totally different, okay? And so then this joint venture is the one who engages. And 
from a financial perspective, one of the things that investment firms say is, okay, we'll let you guys make some money because we understand that you need to have employees. Uh, and that's a sort of give and take. You know, that's part of the financial negotiations. When Ali was talking about the, uh, the, the terms of development agreements or construction management agreements or property management agreements, it ultimately comes back to a very overall discussion that needs to be had about what are the financial terms between partners. Now, I don't know if I answered your question. I think so. So the development agreements and everything are of course with the JV partner. Will be with a JV, which may include the partners. principles of this business, or it may be strictly with a third party. And what most merchant, I'll answer all the questions, what most merchant development businesses do is some combination of third party work where they're earning fees just to keep the machinery going, and some joint venture deals where they've got some equity or some potential upside. And we'll go in this class and in another class about then how do you structure this and how do you create incentives for the developer, okay? I, we, we won't cover that today. One second, I had one had a question. Yeah, I know they asked this already, I don't know if it's a liberal subject, but what, what about a, a, a development fee of 20% out of the profit? What is it called and is that uncommon or is it common? No, you're talking about a promoted interest. That's, and we, yeah. And that's, we'll that's more of a, a, of a compensation or, or, or a waterfall inside of a deal. Okay. Uh, but not a fee that you would pay for the services. Yes. And, and what that tells me is you weren't paying attention to the capital markets class. Is it? No, we'll do uh, I'll go through that. I'll go through that again. I'll go through that again because we did go. And, and to go to go to even a little bit further on, on the point on the point that, that, that George was making, if 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 you if you're developing a property and you have a joint venture here, and let's say for example you you know you bought the land uh, and you were able to uh, or develop this asset, sit on it for over a year and sell it, you could be potentially when you sell this on a tax perspective, be paying capital gains on this, right? Capital gains rate being a lower tax rate. Where what, whatever's originated on this side from the from the services would be ordinary. Meaning, this pays a higher tax rate than a preferred capital gain. So just from, a, from an ownership perspective and from a tax perspective, it would be something that you wouldn't want to do. And, and understand, we said the other day, we try to structure all real estate transactions to be the most tax efficient possible. And ultimately, these are in some sort of advantaged vehicle where ultimately you've got an individual investor which has rights to capital gains, preferred capital gains rates, as opposed to corporate structures Sorry. which do not have preferred capital gain, gain, gains rates. Okay? Just now, Anthony, that, your what question. What would be the trigger there? Because even if you're a merchant developer and you form a joint venture, you're still a merchant developer and your, your intent is to sell it or to sell your stake in it to your partner. T so typically. Would it still be a, a merchant and would you still pay uh, ordinary income? That depends on how that's it. It's, it's, structure. it's a good it's a good question, but it depends on how you structure the deal. Uh, what would be the triggers? Tip, tip, well, go go go. One, one way. Feel free to try it. One, one way that I've seen one way that I've seen this done is that you have a partnership to develop a, a piece of real estate, and rather than sell the property, you can sell the interest in the partnership. Okay, back mm -hmm. to your partner. Back to your yeah. partner. Okay, and that would and, be. Yeah. And if you do that, and you look, you know, I mean, there you get into very sure. detailed tax sure. uh, tax issues. But there, if you look at the cost incurred from 12 months out, right, you're able to, you know, basically come up to a proration where you can take a capital gains on the amount that's over a year, okay, and ordinary income and the difference. I see. Although from a business model perspective, the question is also, what does a merchant developer typically do? Does he develop and sit on assets or does he churn? And, and again, there's, there's no reason why, but, but there's behavior, there's history that demonstrate most merchant developers are in it for fast money. So little equity, let's get in, let's build it, and let's, there's a greater fool theory. There's a greater fool who's going to buy it from me. Let's flip it. Most merchant developers, especially in South Florida, don't hold on to assets for very long. And a lot of these joint venture deals, because then the other part of all these agreements is, in addition to fees, 
there's going to be some takeout with this guy. Okay? Where after you've gone through the development process and you reach a certain level of what we call stabilization, his phones weren't allowed in this class. Oh, taking a picture of the diagram. Dude, this is like intellectual no, property no, rights. <laughs> you haven't asked for permission. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you gotta blur it out. Yeah, if he can actually see it. But the, the last deal that you've got is is some sort of takeout. And so this guy here is taking the deal and he's not doing it for, oh, I'm gonna sit, because the timelines are different. Teachers need money in 20 years when people retire, right? You can't wait 20 years. You know, that woman's college, you know, she wants an airplane or whatever. <laughs> so you got to cash out, okay? And so because you've got different sort of timelines on the money, on the investment, mm -hmm. most merchant developers will be in it for a very short period of time and are hopefully finding a way that up front, especially in today's environment where there's a dearth of deals that make sense and an over and abundance, over abundance of capital, they're going to find a way to say, okay, let's prepackage this thing, let's get the development phase done. Yeah. And, and, and get us the money. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of deals these days are being basically pre-sold. Right. Yeah, uh, pre-sold. You're, you're coming into this. Go ahead. I have a question. Um, in one side, you have the merchant developer, okay? and in the other side, you have the capital. Right. You have the JV, the capital, you have the land, the position. Um, you may have, at some point, multiple JVs for multiple land. Sure. That constitute your inventory. Sure. And is it, how do you structure or how do you uh, maximize your, your tax impact if you hold, because some of that land is for inventory purposes and you're gonna develop over years, right. not necessarily immediately. And today you see the concept of the same merchant developer, but in the capital side, the merchant banking in real estate, where sort of the same kind of structure is hold uh, on a merchant bank, <coughs> that has uh, the JVs or the specific JVs underneath uh, just to be able to serve those customers from the merchant bank and still pass through some of the uh, maintenance and overseeing of that land inventory for um, for a long period and then you know sell them individually. Those are clients of the merchant bank. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure about a merchant. I'm not sure about the merchant bank. I mean, I I, I can speak on the uh, on the side of the developer. Right, I mean, you, each each one of the transactions is the way I've, I've always viewed them siloed into a, a layer of entities of each own. Right, mm -hmm. ultimately, some of the entities may roll up to one common one where the individuals are. I mean, by nature, most of these are. No, I I know those are silos. What I mean is, uh, what I see lately in other parts of the world is one entity that is a whole total, like the same on the merchant development sure. developer. That is a whole goal that has clients, and those clients are the JV partners, the GB yeah. and the G, the GB and the LPs. Okay. Uh, for future purposes, um, they will develop company X that has X land, and like that, they have several <coughs> of them. But they need to charge a fee, uh, or they can asset manage those properties while they're delivered those properties. Um, but the co-investment from the GP, since they're the same individuals that are from the whole goal of the development, yeah. like you said here, they um, benefit or, or can make better their tax structure because in the merchant bank, they pay less tax. I've seen it in Puerto Rico with the IFE, the international uh, uh, structure. What do you mean by merchant bank? A merchant bank is an uh, entity that will co-invest with a company. Uh, it will be a co-investor. Yeah. Not necessarily the GPs, the GP could be a Delaware company, sure. and the co-investment call from a, another company that is owned or is subsidiary or is affiliated with the same individuals. And I in this case, that merchant bank. Okay. I, I, is there anything like that in, in the US? I've seen it in Puerto Rico. I, 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 person, I personally have not seen it. No, 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 is it is I mean, no, I, is I there something like that in the US? But, but be, I stepped out for a second. What okay. is, briefly, what's the question? What I've seen lately <laughs> is the merchant banking concept coming into real estate. 
Um, and I've seen it in a structure in Puerto Rico. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen it in the U.S. per se. Just to benefit and do tax efficiencies for the owners of the GPs, the co-investment. Okay, the, the problem is merchant bank means something. Okay. Yeah, you're co no, 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 merchant bank means something. There's okay. a concept that merchant bank ultimately is a bank, right? It's, it's an institution that puts its money at risk. Yeah. So by concept, a private equity fund, a hedge fund is a merchant bank. So I, I don't know what you mean by merchant bank. Is, is a, right now, is uh, the merchant bank could co-invest, is the co-investment vehicle with a company that will be co-investing with a private equity, with a, a JV, with a LPs, with whatever. Oh, okay, we, we need to table that conversation and okay. I need to understand whether your question is a legal structure question or whether your question is a... It's a tax efficient question. I think it depends on... Well, but it, it, goes back to, uh, uh, it goes back to... That it's not a tax, that's a structuring question. Yeah. But the concept or the term merchant bank, I don't think correlates with what we're talking about right now. So let's table that okay. and let's talk about it outside. Okay. Chad had a question, I think Justin had so, a question. So if the, if the goal is to constantly churn and to be moving things as quickly as possible, all of your, all of your loans that you're gonna try to take out as a merchant developer are gonna be like bullet loans, balloon stuff, so that, so that you defer all the costs and you try to sell it before you have to refinance. Is sure, that, sure, sure. Is Typically, that the goal? like, is to, to try to keep the cost at minimum until you it get is. it up and running, and then you and then you sell it, and somebody else has to pay the bill for the refinance. Well, cost. Uh, typically, the type of loan set that you're going to get, if you're going to develop something, right? You need a construction loan. So usually, what you seek to find is a construction loan that has the ability to have an extension for a few years. Um, anywhere between five and seven, usually, right. right? Well, you stabilize, uh, and yes, after that, you will require, you know, you require a refi. Now, the idea is that by then you'll be out. You'll be sold. Yeah. Exactly, you'll be sold. And yeah. if you did a sale of the partnership interest, then the, you know the partner will bought you out. Would still have the debt on for another few years before they have a need to refinance. Anybody else? <clears throat> Was Mr. Codina, when he got started, was he a home builder? Is that how he started it? Is a home builder? Or is a I, I, I can give I you th I think George can answer older. that one. Armando had a. I'll, I'll, I'll share another story another day. As a matter of fact, I'll share it later today in our credit analysis. I'll tell you how he originally started. But um, by the 1970s, he had a, a computer processing business. And you don't know what that is because you're too young. But before there was a computer on everybody's desk, especially in medical practices, he had a, a business of focus on doing medical buildings. So, you know, somebody would bring him all the paperwork and somebody would key punch it and, uh, and then you'd produce all the building. And he sold that business in the late 70s and he got bored. He made a fair bit of, you know, for what was then a fair bit of money, he got bored. And then he started dabbling primarily in home building in the early 80s. Um, and it was a, actually a, a predecessor business was called Kadena Homes. That's right. And they putzed around with that for a while until uh, until they got into Beacon Center in the late '80s, early well, he '90s. Well, did Deering Bay. Um, they, they, well, they right. They started Deering Bay, and that all blew up during Hurricane right. Andrew. And you know, the question WCI wound up stepping in and finishing that project. But with the same partners that they did Deering Bay. Those guys owned a, a 200 some odd acre parcel of land west of the Miami International Commerce Center, which is what is today called Beacon Center. And that's how they got into commercial development. Okay. And in a business totally morphed into a true classic merchant developer. We didn't do any housing at all. We, we kind of started doing something in Kendall and that didn't happen. And, that's right. And then, uh, but we were, you know, we were industrial office with very little retail in between. But he started, yes, Kadena Homes out, you know, Southwest Bay doing um, doing that kind of work, yeah, and they he did a lot of industrial uh, out in West State as a result. Right, 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 right. That's how we got. Yeah, we started with Beacon Center, and then yeah, you know, there were five or six Beacon projects that went from that. Uh, all in the Medley, the, what is now Doral, or just uh, 
generally called Air Force West Market. That's right. Um, so, just just like these org charts you guys see here, um, you know, uh, on my desk, literally on my hutch, I have a three inch binder with an org chart for every deal we have. And all in all, we account for over 130 different companies mm -hmm. uh, as a result of all this, right? Because by nature, um, you know, these real estate deals have multiple layers because you may have multiple partners at each at each uh, level, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to, they're, they're, they may not have a lot of transactions on a day-to-day -day basis, especially in the investments, but nonetheless, each one of them is 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 a living is a living entity. It has a bank account, has a tax return that that needs to be filed. Um, some of them have very specific things that need to be measured. Some of them have, you know, preferred return calculations that need to be measured on a quarterly basis. Some of them have financial reporting deadlines. Especially if you have a lender, uh, they're they're going to be measuring your financial statements. They're going to be measuring your uh, Occupancy, your debt service coverage ratios. Uh, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of reporting uh, among all these companies. Um, so, Ali, it, it, it's it's probably not as important now, but when you work more at, at, at the old city now, you also have reporting to partners. Maybe talk a little bit about everyone's got a different accounting system and a different. Sure, account. sure, sure, sure. So. Just like we talked about the development management services agreement being, you know, the, the, the constitution of what's the responsibility between the developer and the owner, uh, when you, you know, you have a joint venture, you're going to have an LLC, an limited liability company operating agreement, right? Which is what's going to dictate the responsibilities and the authority of each one of the partners, who the managing partner is, uh, what the responsibilities are, etc. So, for example, if you, if, you know, we may have a deal with an institution. And that institution may need certain reporting so that they can record their investment in this particular project on their books by X date. Um, so, and sometimes those dates are mid-month. Whereas, you know, you may close the books for the project on a normal 30, you know, the 30th of every month. Uh, it's very common that those partners will make you do a close right smack in the middle of the month, especially if they're a fund. Uh, and it's very common for those partners to ask you to keep two sets of books. Because what happens, a lot of times these funds basically keep their books on a cash basis because they have to be priced to market. Uh, so it, 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 you know, not only do you have to keep a set of books for the construction, keep a job costing, and keep gap financials. Because when you sign a construction loan, the bank is going to say, I want to see a set of audited gap financials on the yearly. But at the same time, you're going to have cash financial statements that you need to have for your partner, because otherwise they can't roll it up into their fund. Um, so each one of these entities, being that they have different partners or different uh, structures or agreements, etc., have requirements of their own. Um, you know, some partners are more lenient than others. Uh, there's partners that want reportings within 15 days of a quarter end. Uh, there's partners that have reporting requirements 75 days after a quarter. Uh, so I don't even require anything. I mean, it, it, it all varies. It all varies. But it, you know, the key, the key thing to keep in mind always is, um, if you guys, you know, find yourselves in a situation where you're in the process or involved in the process of structuring this agreement with a partner, uh, I, I'd always say, <laughs> consult your accountant on the financial requiring, uh, reporting requirements. Uh, because one of the things I often see is a lot of developers and a lot of the legal team will say, you know, yes, yeah, sure, by the 10th day of every business month, we can deliver to you a full package of all this financial information. Hmm. It, easier said than done, right? I mean, it requires me obtaining the payout from the contractor, making sure the things are closed, that we have gotten funded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, one of the things I've always made it a habit to do is to make sure when, when these negotiations are happening that you know the accountant not only gets the re, you know the final operating agreement once the deal's been closed but at least try to chime in and negotiate some of those dates to give you know the, the accounting team the opportunity to prepare those reports and meet all those deadlines 
when you're talking about so many different projects, they all pretty much stack. Everybody wants their information as soon as possible. So uh, it's an important thing to keep in mind. What happens do when you, you Do you follow any uh, set of guidelines, like IMPA, for example, the like International Olympic Association, um, that basically makes you send your reports in a, the same way to all your partners? Yeah. So no, the, the, the financial reports usually are, are US GAAP. Uh, they're based on, on, on uh, U.S. GAAP, on generally accepted accounting principles. Um, outside of that, some partners may have specific reports that they need for their for their information. Some of them may need a, you know, a sources and uses for the month. Uh, some of them may require just a budget to let their <coughs> partners know or, or their team know how you know how the project is doing on cost versus actual. Uh, but no. Gonna ask what happens when your, the reports are late? Right. Well, you know the agreement, the the, the development management agreement says that the, the, the developer has to you know to meet these obligations by a certain time. The LLC agreement says you have to report by X days. Um, I haven't seen one occurrence where if you're a day late or, or two days late, there's been an issue. Uh, but I'm sure that you know if, if you as the partner and you and you're the managing partner and you have this responsibility to report this information and just ignore it altogether, I'm sure there can be consequences in, in you know in that partnership as as a result of you not meeting your obligation. Any question? Uh, do you have some auditing or something like this? Because uh, as a real life, you can receive a report, but uh, the the report not not always is the the true uh, because you you put inside uh, some information <coughs> data that is not good the process right and you obtain information that it is not for that I think that she has about the standards maybe the yeah the because uh, sometimes the information that you have is not the real situation of the of contract or all of the other company. You you make some uh, auditing or something like this, or you have a, an accounting company that you prepare to align all the all the companies that are working together in the same page. I, mean, you understand? Uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, internally, all the reporting that we do as far as financial reporting is concerned will be on U.S. GAAP. Okay. No, no, I understand Across the, the rules, but the Who you got, you? but the, uh, right. The, uh, sorry, sorry, but okay. you you know that number is the most flexible things that you can use numbers, yeah, and you can align your numbers in the US app. It's formal, really, but real life is to put the numbers, real numbers right. inside well, inside the standards. This is my question. Sure, sure, sure. Well, rest assured, you want to use real numbers. Right, and you want your numbers to reflect the reality of each one of the entities, right? Uh, now, are the entities audited? Yes. Are all the entities audited? No. No. That depends. Uh, you may go in with a partner who says, "I want audited financials, and I want it to be my auditor." So you're going to have to use Price Waterhouse Coopers and pay them a hundred thousand dollars a year to do an audit. Okay, perfect. Okay, that may be the case, or that may not be the case at all. Okay. So, Mike, if I understand the substance of your question, uh, my personal experience in yeah, this country yeah. has been that what you see is what you get. And if you're dealing with people whose financial statements aren't what they should be, they don't stay in business long. You read about them in the paper. But at the end of the day, you know, as I said the other day, there's, a, there's an organization called NAREEN, there's an organization called NACREEF, and everybody knows one another. And if you're Kadena, you're not going to do a deal with Northwestern or Matt or Pru or ING or anybody else unless you're straight up. You just don't survive. I, I, I think that your question is, you know, whether the numbers really reflect what's going on in this country, my experience. At, a, at, a, at, a, at the level of development that we're talking about, yeah, what's, you know. Yeah, but because it, is, it was not my, my, my real experience in this country, because I was working in two different uh, CPA companies at first, 
when I came here and I decided not work more because they work, 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 work. Well, the former, I put all and uh, return earning, all to return earning. Well, but that is I, my I'm experience. telling you, at, at, at the level that we're talking about, at the institutional level, it's, it's, it's good. You're, you're, yeah. Yeah, I'm not telling you it's going to be a problem, but I, I, that's, that's what I've always come across. So, Thank you. Thank you. That's just what they said to the IRS. There's a class on gap, Dustin. I keep telling you that. <laughs> IRS, you know. I remember my comment with the standards is not increasing U.S. gap, and I just wanted to clarify to you. It's not increasing U.S. gap. We assume that it's in U.S. gap. Sure. Is that the largest LPs in the world, Culpers, teachers, etc., Blackstone, they all came together and created the International Limited Partnership Association. And to facilitate the, wo the world for a developer or for a fund, they created a standard set of guidelines. Like the minimum requirement they want to see on a report. Uh, like, for example, the budget this way, the cost approach this way, this X. Uh, so if I receive your your balance or your memoirs reporting or your report, package. Right. 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 On the 15th before the end of the quarter, sure. I receive yours, I receive the one from Blackstone, I receive the one from Stepstone, and they all are the same. So my head is not, okay, what he's trying to do? And okay, I can yeah, take a look yeah, at yeah, all yeah. of them at the same time, and they all have basically the same information. Those are guidelines, you don't have to, to assume all of them, Right. but it's like a standard package. Okay, so, well, I, I'll tell you, I understand, that was my, I understand that was your my point, point now. If you follow some of those guidelines, that will make your life pretty easy. No, I can tell you from... from they have a package. Please. I can tell you from the, from the partnerships that we've done with the institutional or, or with the banks, etc. I have not seen one yet that has requested that we follow those guidelines. Every, everybody has their own view. Everybody's going to tell you what they want. And they can have all the standards they want, and we can have gap because at the end of the day, we've got gap, and we've got, and within gap, we've got real estate industry guideline, and we've got trends and techniques in the industry. But everybody wants to see things their way, and I'm going to tell you what you know what they want in the form they want it with the tools that they want. So they want it in Argus, Argus, and they want you know Yardy, Yardy, whatever the heck they want, and I, that's my experience too. So there may be all these guidelines. This is kind of new, and but it was just a question. You know, if you follow them, some of them or not. It was just a question. Not yet. Not yet. Um, so, in in a nutshell, like I was saying, there's there's over 130 different uh, entities that we're accounting right now, um, uh, as a whole. Um, the accounting department uh, where I work consists of seven people now. Five years ago when I started, it was uh, it was yours truly. Uh, so we have seen a lot of growth over the last five years, and, and we're, we're keeping very busy. Um, so now that I've told you a little bit about myself, about the company I work for, how we're structured, and a little bit of all the things that that we do, uh, do any of you guys have have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, typically, when you enter when you enter a deal, do, do you guys go and buy the land in cash, and then bring in the partner? To build a project with you, as a joint venture. That that could very well be the case, right? Keep in mind that when um, when you find when you find debt to, to construct a project, uh, say you find a twenty five million dollar uh, facility for as a construction loan, you're going to have an equity requirement. Sure. Right. So more than likely, what most people do is that they buy the land and they use the land as the equity. That's right. Into ah, the deal. Okay. So yes, land is usually bought cash. Now, would you typically buy it yourselves or with your financial partner? That depends. Either if way. the stars align and we can close on it simultaneously, mm -hmm. <clears throat> beautiful. If we see an opportunity to, to, to buy a piece of land and um, and and you know and we don't have the partner lined up right. or they're not ready or right. etc., we'll we'll buy it. Gotcha. We'll buy it ourselves. And, and, and you know, I, I would answer the question. I think. Family office has a different perspective sure. and a different resource base sure. than most merchant developers. And I would tell you, most merchant developers, look, you play with other people's money whenever you can. And ultimately, it's a business of leverage, right? So if you can line up the deal, right. up so, but typically, you know, again, I think you, Ali came to work with us when we had money and we had, you know, he didn't work there when we didn't have any money. And, you know, he had to rough it. But ultimately, you structure the deal. 
and then you run as hard as you can, and that's why institutional relationships are important, because hopefully you can get it all set up, and now you run and put five books out there, or ten books out there, and see what the best deal is, but you gotta convince somebody before you gotta close. Okay. So in a merchant development model, typically you're running really hard right after you've tied something up so that you don't have to come up with money. Long time frames and go find your money? Long time frames and then go find well, your I, money? Well, I don't think it's typically long. And again, you know, one of the things I said the other day is you know, diligence period, again, what do we have now? A dearth of deals and an overabundance of capital. So you don't see what's happening in the marketplace today is it's like really short diligence period, you know, and cash rules and all this stuff. And so okay. uh, what happens is, is that period's been closed. But what would typically be, you know, you rarely see once you tie a deal up or you've gone hard that you've got more than, you know, 30 to 90 days on an outside in order to close on something. You know, because again, if you're on the seller side, what are you going to do? You want your money now, right? Time is risk. And so, you know, if, if I want to tie a piece of land up with you, what, what's my motivation to give you a long period of time? The only place where you, again, we'll talk about it with the home builders. Land is a different story because land has considerations with inability, inability to finance, entitlements, right. et cetera. And so there you're likely to see options or long or long closing periods typically to allow for entitlements 150 to be, days etc 150 day or or longer yeah. i mean you know or longer i mean i've seen you know two years right right beacon lakes was tied up for almost four years because that was actually an expansion to the urban development boundary in dade county and, and you can only apply for that even every two years so you know so you it, it, it really depends. Right. I mean, I've seen it up, after land options go out to 10 years. Sure, you just pay them a little bit to sit tight with you. Wait. Uh, or maybe you don't pay anything at all. I mean, if you have it under that option and you lock it in, right. there's a lot of a lot of merchant builders that have land under options. And it really works you out. pay for the option, wouldn't right. you? Right. Yes, sir. The question back here. Uh, so, Kadena had, what, an option to buy that we contingent had, that on the the movement of the urban boundary line? Yeah, there were there were multiple. There was actually that was an assemblage of land. So that that piece of um, what what became four hundred acres were several buyers that were put together over a period of time and they were all options. And the options so there was money down, there was money at risk, but ultimately the closing was contingent upon inclusion of that in the urban development boundary. So the home run. Uh, um, that one did well. I, the one that did better is is the one we did in Hialeah. Where we actually bought that one, and then we put it in the urban development boundary afterwards. I mean that that parlayed 30 million bucks into what was ultimately about 130 million dollars worth of value that came up within a year and a half. Yes, sir. Are your JV partners set up for project, or your JV? JV set up to handle more than one project? Uh, usually a joint venture will be, you know, project specific. Okay. Now, you can have multiple joint ventures with the same partner. That's right. Yes. So you repeat some of the same people you partner with. Yeah, and, and, and that goes back to, 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 you know, to what George was saying. If, if you do things right and you, you're able to maintain a relationship with a financial institution, you are really set up yourself to be able to do a lot more business go a lot smoother for you on all the legal because now you're basically using the same set of documents over and over again uh, on different projects. But, but Brian, that doesn't preclude an entity called Beacon Lakes LLC that owns the 400 acres from creating a bunch of individual entities for each one of the projects that's undertaken here. Or to potentially even bring in outside partners on some of this to develop part of that. So a, a, a especially a master plan builder, okay? And stop to think, um, a home builder may take down, you know, 600, 1,200 acres, and they may be home builders, right? They're not retail developers, you know, they're not office builders, but an urban or a, a planning order may require those other uses, right? So 
a joint venture may partner with somebody else to develop part of that land. They may outright sell it. That's typically what a developer will do is sell off the pieces of, 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 of uh, entitlements that they're not you know, adept at, okay? Uh, but you typically would see multiple entities under a partnership for specific development activities there. What happens to those, all those partnerships once the property is sold, developed in full, and stabilizes? You, you still got years, like, you know, you got to keep records open for three to five years, and there's always some sort of, like, activity that filters in after that the fact. I mean, it, why do you think he's got seven people working with him? I mean, it, you know, and then you got a guy running a family office as a retired structuring partner, quite a case, and he loves entities. And, and, and he's got a very complex mind. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's very talented. Entities. He's very, very talented. But he loves creating entities, you know? <laughs> and then I have to deal with the aftermath of reality. So. No, it's not me. No, no, oh. no, 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 it's not me. No, 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 I don't know. No. It's a gentleman named Larry Bragg. That's right. Who's a retired partner at White, White and Case. That's right. So that's that's in a nutshell the the, the accounting world, right? Uh, that we live in. It's very fast paced. Uh, there's always a lot of a lot of balls in the air. Um, we just got through um, six different audits uh, with three different firms, um, and just you know got through all of our tax reporting. We, we use an outside CPA firm to do all of our tax work. Well, that's it's done in house, um, and it's 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 a lot of fun. Real estate accounting is is challenging. Every entity, every deal uh, is diverse. Um, yes, just a, a quick question for you. The internal, you know, obviously you require, um, you know, the, the reporting from your your internal companies to sure. put together these reports for the investors. Sure. Um, like, what what would what would you require from, say, your your real estate fund or your developer people? I mean, it's monthly, right? And they have to provide you some information. And how do you set that up? Is that an agreement that's, that you put out to the it's, company? It's the other way around. It, He's doing the reporting for, for that, the investors right. in the fund. Right, but he needs the actual numbers. So that's, that's what I'm saying. That's, he needs the, sure. That's, and, I'm do, and, and, and me and so, my team are doing, uh, doing the numbers, right? So, so, so are they constantly just giving you the numbers, or are you having to pull <laughs> them? Yeah, I understand what you said. Are you having to pull them from those? Cool. Okay. So, okay. so let, let, let's, let's give you an example. Yeah, okay. yeah. So let, it, first of all, you have to define who is your audience. Okay, and what do I mean by that? Uh, let's say that my audience is, for, for the financial reporting, is an investor. Okay, and let's say one of them is an investor, let's say the other one's an institution. Okay, uh, this particular institution may want to see every single line of expense on a multifamily deal that we have that's operational. Okay, and here I may have 30 or 40 different investors who want to see the overall performance. Now, this audience cares for the detail. You'll bore this audience to death if you give them 10 pages of financial statements with different repairs of maintenance lines for light bulbs, AC, carpet. So first you have to define who your audience is, right? Now, if your audience is an investor in this property, you want to prepare something that is sophisticated, condensed, has a format that's very easy to follow, yeah. okay? Now, if it, on the other hand, if you, you know, if you have somebody who, who's a, a, a partner with you and they want to make sure that you're hitting every line in your budget, they're going to want something that's very specific. So that, that first defines who the audience is. Now, assume a fund or assume a single, a single property, you will have an accountant assigned to that property. So under the concept that we're talking about one single piece of real estate, that accountant will be assigned to that apartment complex would record all the financial transactions, would do a month and close, reconcile their accounts, etc. I prepare a package for review to a controller. Okay? So that controller would sit down, would go over the report, page by page, make sure that the balance sheet has a balance sheet schedule, a reconciliation, or something that tells it this number's right, or here's what's behind that number. Right? Would review the PL, make sure that you know, the, the rent ties, 
that the uh, schedule supporting the vacancies tie, etc., would look at the journal entries the account that made, etc. We'll just go through an entire process of review and sign off on it. Once that review's been completed, that financial package will arrive on my desk. I would go through it, review it, see if I had any notes from the month before, etc. And if everything looks good, that entity, that property, the books of that property for the month can be closed. Then you can begin your report. Whether it's to that institution with all the detail, or whether it's the very simple and condensed version to the investor. Well, you visit it for, for your... <laughs> for, for all and, your then, and then investors <laughs> ask questions every now and then. They, there's guys that send emails asking questions on the financials. Yeah, I know. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for your 130 entities, you and your team of seven employees are the accountants for those entities, right? So one a, accountant would have a number of entities that they manage and multiple, multiple, yeah. multiple, multiple, yeah. multiple, right? And and, yeah. and and that's a good question. So uh, one of the things that 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 I found is that you know these real estate uh, transactions are always you know set up in ways where there's multiple layers, right? So for example, let's say you may have uh, this entity, right, uh, own 25% of a project down here, right? And what I have found is best practices is I would assign accountant A to do this project, right? And then I would assign accountant B to do the parent company. Mm -hmm. That way there's a check and balance right. between the two. So at the end of the day, accountant B has to do, you know, we call it an equity pickup. Right? Meaning they have, to, they have to do equity accounting and say, hey, I need your financial statement and I need to pick up 25% of it into these books. Mm -hmm. right? um, that really has, has, has helped us make sure that, you know, sometimes if you look at one layer and the layer above, the layer above, all the numbers kind of get mixed and, 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 and matched in your mind. So, um, and, and, and pragmatically, it's not even in an entity like this, you know, whether there's fraud, it's just an entity of making, it's, a, it's making sure that things are right. right. Exactly. A different set of eyes, a review. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In your multifamily division, what, what typically do you look for in size of a, of a project? Is there like a, a minimum threshold you like to stay above as far as units or? That, that, that you know, that, that goes more with the operational, with the guys that are seeking the deals. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more in the background dealing with what happens after they, they yeah, close I on that. I might have Andy come one day to speak in class. Well, that, he, he'd yeah. be a great speaker. He, he'd be exactly be the person who would okay. be able to answer. Okay. Yeah. I'm having lunch with him this week, and I was going to ask him if he wanted to come in. So. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm dealing with what happens after the gotcha. fact. You know, my, 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 you, my number one get, quote is sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm the guy after the parade when the elephants go, you know, that's good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with all the facts. Uh, because, it, 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 look, it's reality. The, the people that are making the deals yeah. are not thinking of the yeah. Right? They're, they're focused, and, and it's not their job, right? Let's be clear. Their job is to find a deal, max, maximize profits, and, and, and to develop these relationships. Right. Well, one way to maximize profits certainly would be uh, to minimize the work and rework that you and your team have to do with so, some one-off reporting requirements, right? Well, what happens? We're being compensated for that. Yeah. How are okay. we being so compensated fees, for right? How, well, that's it. Yeah. Part okay. of the development fee that you're paying mm -hmm. is compensating us for doing the books and records. Exactly. Okay. But I think that the message here is and it's what I've said since I started working, because you know I started as an auditor, I'm used to see it being you know, on the audit side. Get your financial people, you know, the purpose of this class is not to make any of your accountants, but it's make you aware of what the implications of all that you're doing are. And ultimately, as I said, if accounting is history, right, it's the book that you're gonna write on what you're doing, it's, it's you don't want the tail wagging the dog. So you don't want to make deals based upon the ramifications or the work involved in accounting. But you need to make sure that you pull people in so that when you structure, you understand what the implications and the costs and the time frames are. And I'll tell you, my biggest issue when I got involved in, in, in negotiations and structuring with partners was always, what are the deadlines people are asking for, right? What's the type reporting? And listen, the developer doesn't care, he just wants to get the deal done. 
But at Kadena, at one point, we were working with six or seven different accounting systems because we had so many partners. And so, as, as Ali was saying, we kept a gap set of financials on Timberline because that was the accounting system we used. And that's how we paid bills, and that's how we issued you know, POs, and, and, uh, and how we booked receipts of cash, and how we did our budgeting. But then all of a sudden, we had a guy here that you know, wanted to use you know, Yardy and, you know, uh, you know, I, I forget, you know, the one with the, the letters. MRI. MRI, yeah, you know, MRI. and all of these, all of these other systems, right? And you say, well, you know, as long as you understand there's a cost, there's a timing, there's a com complexity, and well, you know, then it's okay, right? But you need to just be aware of the timing that's involved in all of this, right? And just understand the personnel that you go, yeah. well, why do I need to have an accountant? You know, because they have to report to all of your partners and make them happy and keep them happy. So, do accountants become specialized in your specific, uh, like maybe I'm a great Argus, you know, writer. You know, I know Argus. I've used right. that for a long time, and then maybe he's an MRI guy. Do you, would you ever split it up like that, or or do you guys just know all of the systems? Or no, 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 no. I mean, there's, there's basically right now we're using two systems. We're either using Yardi or we're using MRI. You would, you would, would you give an accountant them both, where you'd have to do two different types, or would you try to keep them? There's, there's instances where one accountant has to use both for the same property. Right. Meaning, we may keep the gap books in Yardi, and all the history is there, and all the depreciation is there, etc. And at the end of the month, we may have to export those financials, and you know, do do something that we call the bridge is well, how do we bridge these gap financials to cash? Because now we gotta go over to MRI and record the activity but on a cash basis. Mm -hmm. um, so it, those are the two, you know, that's at, at the extent of, of, of what I've seen as far as using systems. Luckily we only use two. I make a push uh, always to use Yardi because I found that it, for what we do in real estate, it's, it's, it's very complete and very flexible. Uh, and it's an internet-based system. So it allows people to collaborate, work from anywhere anywhere in the world. Um, we have properties in Dallas that use Yardi. And, and one of the things I do is, well, to avoid them having to report to me and not just getting a piece of paper at the end of the month, is I say, fine, we're gonna buy that deal. And we may be a 50% partner. And I say, okay, well, fine, but I'll add that property to my database. Mm -hmm. And what it allows me to do is set up a user or two or three or four, as many as they need, and that software will help them do the leasing, do the accounting, the reporting, etc. But I have full access to it at any point in time. And I can assign to them that one property. So all they will see is that single building. Yeah. Okay? Uh, but it does allow me the flexibility if something is late or something is, is wrong or I need a report and not have to wait for them and have the ability to run it uh, from our database. It was part of my question. So how do you guys manage the 130 bags of receipts that get thrown out on, on your desk? Well, it, it, every bank has a bank account, right? Um, every LLC. Every LLC has a bank account, okay? And ideally, in a perfect world, right, in, in an accountant's um, uh, dream, right, <laughs> we would close on a property and the partners would you know, each fund, let's say that up here you had two partners. You know, partner A and partner B each have an LLC. And then, you know, ultimately there's the individuals, right? Well, the reality of life is that 99% of the time the individual is going to wire direct to an entity. Maybe here, may even be down here. Okay? Making the accounting even harder. Because why? If you, could, if you could account for the cash that's flowing through the LLC, you have an audit trail, you have a date of funding, which is important, um, and it really you know, clarifies things for you. Now, you know, this, this partner here may have said, you know, oh no, we're funding this deal, send the wire to this entity. Then you wind up having to, or I'm, you know, I wind up having to reconstructed an entry here, right, to record an investment and a capital account for the money that this partner sent. 
and do the same thing over here, right? And ultimately down here. So, so you know, in, in a per, and that's why I say in a perfect world, why do I have 130 bank accounts? Because I want them to use them, right? Uh, because that's the only way that I can I can keep my sanity. Because otherwise, if they start funding yeah. things directly, I have to do a lot of paper entries to exactly. record those movements. Um, same thing goes now. You know, it's it's easier for me to control the money coming out because then they have no choice, right? Because the money's coming from the bottom up, and then, then you know, I'll tell them, fine, we'll get distributions out in a day because I need to clear two or three bank. Here's the other lovely thing. This may be Wells Fargo, this may be Ocean Bank, and this may be Bank of America, right? right. Because down here, if you had a construction loan, when you did the construction loan, the bank asked you to keep a bank account with them. Yes. So if this was Bank of America, a uh, Bank of America loan, you have a Bank of America bank account. Now here, you may have you know, primary business with Wells Fargo, and this may be a Wells Fargo account. And the partner may be banking with a totally different bank. Uh, so just the, the treasury of moving funds in and out can, you know, can be quite substantial. Because you're dealing basically with the same money multiple times, right? Uh, so it's harder for me to keep the owners or you know the, the people that are that are closing these deals on check and asking them to fund. And listen, opening a bank account these days is no walk in the park. Federal regulation on banking is is really really strict. They want to know you know who you dated in high school. I mean, they they ask you for security questions, your driver. Everything, and they want to know who are the owners above the entity for which you're getting that bank account, and they want to view their documents as well. So, yeah, and, and how do we keep track? We reconcile, and if something like what I just described happens, we make sure that you know we we have the support to create the entries at each one of those levels to reconcile those capital. This, this is one of the biggest clusters in development businesses, and I. When I was the CFO at Kadena, I walked into a lot of um, informal, um, you know, uh, mechanisms, and I mean informal. You know, Entity A had cash, and you needed to do something in Entity D, which had a different ownership structure, but somebody just wrote a check from this entity to that one, right. and then you wind up with all these intercompany or you know, do to from accounts yeah. that you got to reconcile every month and. Yep. The only way to do it is, is to have rigor, right? So, if uh, if you have strong financial, you know, leadership in a business and they are empowered, and they are empowered and given all the responsibility, then that doesn't happen. Most development businesses are, you know, they're cowboys, right? So, just stuff happens, you know, and and then you wind up with this whole paper trail, you know, problem. And, and I, I I lived it as an auditor. I lived it in real life working in a development business, and it's very easy to lose track of money and transactions. Yeah. It is. Especially it is. when you've got so many entities, right? And, oh, is. I'll remember. And the worst one is when you don't see that that much anymore, but back in the 80s, you'd see a lot of disbursements coming out at closings, you know? And so, you know, I remember doing an audit for a business where, you know, inevitably we'd have to go every year to some attorney's office and go through what happened at a closing and you know where stuff got, create where stuff got distributed you know to ultimately figure out you know they, they bought this they paid this guy off they paid that other debt off you know so but again to the extent that you can do things the right way the first time the accounting falls right into place if yeah. funds aren't commingled right ultimately especially when you've got different partners and different ownership structures the worst thing you can do is commingle funds, or share funds, or borrow, you or know, bypass, or bypass an entities. entity. Uh, uh, not just for the accounting records, but also for uh, ultimately for the compensation, right? Because if you know a, a, a lot of the, a lot of the deals in real estate, I know you mentioned you're going to cover them in a later class. Will will pay a preferred return uh, based on capital, right? And the trigger for that is when did that money come into the entity? All of a sudden, if you bypass different layers of companies, you don't really have a hard day. You can go back to a bank statement and say, yeah, that's when the money came in. Uh, so yeah, that's an uphill battle, constant. Uh, and, and it requires 
you know, sometimes it requires uh, some, some friction, right, with some of your operational people uh, because they're on a hurry to get the deal done, to make a deposit on, a, on, an, uh, on an asset, et cetera. And you're telling them, well, hold on, don't wire there, wire here, and then give me, you know, six hours to move the money around because the bank, once I send the wire, the bank needs to call me back. They need to confirm my identity. They need me to verify the wire. Then I got to do the same thing at two other banks. It takes time. Right. So, um, so how many secret questions do you have? Oh, man. <laughs> that's, that's classified. <laughs> <laughs> I got fired just from listening. <laughs> that's classified. It looks like a lot of work. How do you keep um, like financial controls 